Prime Minister of Norway, Jonas Gar Storé. Have I done that correctly? Excellent. Okay. Just like home. Please. Thank you. Welcome. Um, Prime Minister, uh, I have been fortunate to go to your country uh, a couple of times. You are blessed with hydropower and you've uh, championed the electric vehicle transition very, very early. So much so that the sales of new internal combustion engine vehicles will be done by 2025, is that right? That's right. That's 10 years before the most ambitious state in the US. That's 10 years before California. Um, You've really, you've created a low carbon future. Uh, Norway has been at work uh, at, on this for a long time. What are the lessons in your view for, for other countries trying to go in that direction? Well, first message is that politics works. Incentives work. Uh, we are a small country, five million people. And when we made a decision to give very clear incentives to um, electric car uh, vehicles uh, buyers, um, uh, it worked, you know, uh, we, we, we cut uh, VAT, uh, we gave them uh, access to uh, files uh, on, on the roads, uh, you know, um, a lot of incentives and it worked. The other part was that industry responded. We have no car industry in Norway, mm. but, the, but the European car industry said that this small country of 5 million people, should we change our production line to have more electric vehicles for this small country? They did. That was possible. So you are right, we are now up to 80, 90% of the new car sale. But I heard this morning, you know, other very stimulating news on this from the head of the IEA, Fatih Birol, who said at the conference I attended earlier this morning that two years ago, one out of 25 cars, new sold cars in the world were electric. This year is one out of five. So there's a major change going on. And I believe perhaps Norway's early experience um, mm -hmm. That, to that. that uh, incentives work, po policies work. Of course, just across the North Atlantic, you're seeing a very different move. Uh, the British Prime Minister Rishi Sunak just delayed the uh, implementation of those of those rules. W what do you make of that? Elections are coming, and uh, <laughs> no, but this is a this is a serious issue because I, I believe it's a bit of kind of saying that. And he's right in the sense that if you impose measures that you know, will turn people against the change that is necessary, it's a democratic challenge. I'm happy to see that my sister party, the Labour Party, uh, went against his statements uh, because holding a high ambition here is important exactly for the reason of making politics work. Because if you, if you stay, by, stay put with these clear ambitions, there will be adaptations from industry, from technological innovations, and so on. You know, Norway has imposed its own CO2 tax mm -hmm. into the economy. We are bound by the European uh, trading system, so there's a, there's a CO2 tax for industry and, and right. all the rest. But we are saying also, in addition to that, we will have, uh, by up till 2030, uh, climbing to $200 a ton. And it's a linear line like that. And I hear industry say, okay, we believe that's going to happen. So we start to adapt and adjust. And that's why, you know, um, failing on reaching those targets is, is negative in a double sense. It, it, it postpones the impact and it creates uncertainty around the incentives. So, um, and uncertainty for car makers, I would imagine. Yeah, because Brit Brit it's Britain is, of in. course, a, yeah. a much larger uh, cake here. Now, at the same time that you're imagining, that Norway is imagining, uh, you know, this renewable energy future, you're also expanding oil and gas production. In fact, the Russian invasion of Ukraine really gave you um, a, a new market. You are now Europe's top gas producer, and your production numbers are, are going up. Why? How does that square with uh, your own vision that you've laid out for a renewable energy future? I think Europe is happy that this Norway is there, able to do this. Let me explain. We are transitioning out of oil and gas. Our oil reached its historic peak in the early part of the century. It's a bit like this, but this is, oil is going down. We are far under where we were 20 years ago. And it will also happen with gas, with a small exception, I will come to that. 
what happened after the, the Russian invasion was that Europe woke up to the fact that it had not really done the work. Building down nuclear, building down coal without building up renewable. That's a very bad equation. So Europe was faced with a dramatic crisis which, which could have really hit European industry, European families, European economies very badly. What Norway was able to do, and this was technologically quite challenging, was to increase our gas export from existing uh, sites by 8%, which represents about 100 terawatt hours of electricity. Had we not done that, you know, it, it would have been a much more dire situation. It made it possible for Germany to fill up its uh, stocks for the winter. Um, and um, uh, so that was good. But the, 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 the paradox of the Ukrainian war is that it has really been a clarion call that we need to speed up the renewable production uh, of energy to fill the gap which is there when you phase out uh, fossil fuels. And Norway is part of that. You know, we are now ma making major investment in offshore wind, in solar, in land wind, in potential for hydrogen, carbon capture and storage. And, and, and the basic point is, is this, we're going to transition out of oil and gas. This will not happen by putting a date, saying that up until this date we have oil and gas, after that we have other sources. It is a transition. If we don't make that transition work, if we don't connect cutting emissions with creating jobs, we're going to get that trouble, that, that problem of not getting you know, people along with us. And I hear you describing transition like this, and yet, Equinor, a Norwegian company, is seeking to open up a very large field in the North Atlantic, the Rosebank, and facing quite a bit of opposition. What do you say to your critics that if really you're envisioning a transition, expanding oil and gas is not the way to go? Well, first of all, I mean, I, I cannot speak for Equinor, although it's a, there's a state part of property in that company. Their ambition is that in the coming years, their investment into renewables will come up to level with, uh, with, with, the, with oil and gas and go beyond. When? So on the way to 2030. Now, I believe that the change here will have to come from the demand side, and it cannot be by having political decisions to cut the supply side. You know, there will be, by the end of this decade, you will have very good business arguments for not investing in oil and gas and rather investing in solar, wind, hydrogen, these new sources. This will come. And of course then that will you know, affect, that there, will be oil and, there will be oil and gas in the energy equation also in the future. So Norway's question is to say, okay, should we politically decide that Norway will not be part of that and leave it, leave it to the Gulf countries and leave it to you know, other parts? Or will there also be you know, a, a contribution from the Norwegian continent and shelf? But I, I told you before this emission that we are also making the first complete value chain of carbon capture and storage from industry in Europe. We can now receive in, from the Norwegian continental shelf, we have enough storage capacity for all of Europe's CO2 for decades. And we, we, we know how it works because mm. we have done it for 30 years. We can store CO2 two to 3,000 meters under the seabed and it stays. And this is not only important to do that away from gas, but you have to do it from the hard, hard to abate industries in Europe. And, and, and if we don't succeed carbon capture and storage, I believe that we will not reach the overall targets. I'm going to come back to the IEA, whose findings you cited earlier. The IEA has also said an expansion of gas projects is not consistent with an, a 1.5 degree pathway. So why continue to expand? Well, I mean, the way we are going to do this as a community of nations is that we will abide by our Paris obligations. Norway will cut 55% of its emission by 2030. That's on your territory, but exactly. your gas being burned elsewhere. The critics would say that is exporting your climate pollution. Well, but if we How would you respond to I that? I would respond by saying if we had said we're going to cut out that gas before there is our other alternatives, when the invasion in Russia came, Europe would have been in a very, very dramatic situation. So in the future, investors will have to think that, you know, investing in, this, uh, 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 in new energy will have to be renewable. It will be a climate argument, but there will also be a very strong business environment. We plan mm. to build as much offshore wind renewable energy as we today have hydro 
energy in Norway. That's where we're going to put our money. The UN climate negotiations are coming up, COP28. Um, there is already quite um, a debate shaping up between those who advocate for language in the agreement calling for a phase out of fossil fuels and others who say a phase out of unabated fossil fuels. Where do you stand on that? Is Norway willing to commit to any language committing to a phase out well, of fossil ob fuels? Obviously, we have to phase out fossil fuels. We have to transition out of fossil fuels when we build up the alternative. You know, this morning I was with the Global Alliance for People and Planet supporting renewable energy projects in countries where there is no energy at all. Are, is Vietnam going to make investments in coal-fired plants for the next 50 years, or will they do solar, wind, offshore wind? And we have to make a major emphasis uh, on the latter part. So that is really about transitioning out of oil and gas, and especially coal, but at the same time, and that's why I, I am cautiously hopeful about the COP, because I believe on, on mitigation and this transition, we are about to become pretty real. So there has to be tangible illustrations that we can build up the renewable potential for those who have no energy at all, but also for, you know, for industries and, 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 and new projects that will have to go renewable and not fossil. But just to clarify, do you support language in the COP declaration on a phase out of fossil fuels? I mean, I, I will not comment on the language here, but as I, as I tell you, I believe this century is a century of phase out of oil and gas. But okay. I have been against setting a date which is not, we are not secure that you have the alternative mm. that can keep households, economies, industry, and those who have nothing at all uh, Speaking energy. of alternatives, you have said that the global transition to renewables can benefit from deep sea mining, for batteries, for, for example. Uh, Norway is proposing to be the first country that allows commercial deep sea mining operations. There's a lot of concern about this, as, as, you, as you know from environmental groups. And there is a lot of scientific concern that, that not much is known about the impacts on, on, on the ocean, but particularly in an ecological sensitive place like the Arctic. Why the rush? We will not rush and we need to find out. That's my answer. We will not authorize any project anywhere on, on our continental shelf without being sufficiently secure based on the precautionary principle that this is feasible and not uh, you know, uh, causing damage. But let me put this into perspective. Right now, there's a big challenge of getting offshore wind really off the, uh, off the ground massively. And part of it is because you need materials for that industry. You need it for solar panels and so on, which are so-called rare materials. So we, we have a choice now. We can say China can take care of that. They have most of it. Or we can let the small kids in the mines in Africa, you know, keep digging for it. Or we can map other countries, you know, if there are opportunities. Norway has minerals on land, but there's also the potential of having seabed minerals. So we need to map it. Norway has seven times more ocean and continental shelf than land. So we, we have a long tradition of doing responsible management of ocean resources, fish, oil and gas, and now we are moving into offshore wind and so on. So I want to know exactly, you know, we know more about the, 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 the face of the moon than, than the bottom of the, of the large seas. So we need to find out there are minerals there, can they be sustainably uh, um, uh, explored? Uh, and if that is so, I think uh, we should consider doing it, but we are not given any license, any grant, and we are not going to rush it. Your parliament is having a discussion on this in a couple of weeks. What is your government's position? And, and by the way, I understand there's some disagreement in the coalition uh, over, over this. Walk well, us I know we, we, we have put the proposal to Parliament to say we should you know, be ready to do this mapping. We should open areas to see what, what is the potential, what should be the rules, uh, what will it take to, to move forward. But you know, these are not easy issues. We are going to make an energy transition in the world economy. You know, for human civilization, this is the biggest change you can imagine. So this is one, one part of that. It's a pretty small part of it. 
and of course it, it creates debates and conflict and, and, and I think that is also part of it. Mm. So, you know, as a democracy, we will have to debate it. And um, I, I think we will have a majority in parliament in line with Norwegian traditions to, to do uh, the, or the mapping. Uh, and then we can draw conclusions after that. So you're saying the first step is mapping? The first step is debate in parliament? Yeah. To authorize exactly. the mapping? And then we have to invite, you know, interested parties to, to, to come and see uh, what, what is the potential. But, you know, if you're going to do anything on the Norwegian continental shelf, you need a final authorization by government. And the rules and regulations for that decision is up to us to make. Are you not concerned that simply not enough is known about the long-term ecological impacts on the Arctic to to start something like this. Yes, I'm concerned. That's why we don't do that. That's why we want to find out. But we could say, you know, the potential of what is on the, on, 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 on the seabed should not be considered, should not be explored. We, we, we leave that aside and we will find those mineral, mineral, minerals elsewhere. That, that, it's an option. But I think that would, you know, not be in line with what we normally have done to find out what, are, what is the potential of the oceans. You know, I, I chair the, the ocean panel, which is 20 nations, ocean states, uh, uh, promising now to make sustainable uh, ocean uh, preservation plans for all of their ocean areas. We had a meeting here in New York yesterday. We are committed to do that. Uh, uh, in a very serious way. And I think, you know, Norway's track record of, of looking after its ocean and continental shelf indicates that we can hopefully do this also in a sustainable way. Last question. Y your country has prospered from your oil and gas. What does a post-oil and gas economy look like in Norway? And how soon might you envision that? Again, this is a transition. We, we, you know, every income we get from oil and gas does not come to my budget. It comes to the sovereign wealth fund, the pension fund, which is the world's largest now. And we have the right to extract up to 3% of the interest from that fund to, to the budget. So that's for future generations. But, you know, the, the jobs of my children and grandchildren will, I think, to a large extent be in energy, but it will be in a different kind of energy than until today. When I visit Norwegian uh, shipyards and along the industry along the coast, and I meet people of my generations, I ask, what, what are you working on? They are now building the biggest offshore floating wind farms hmm. that you've ever seen, taller than the Eiffel Tower. They started their career building drilling platforms for oil. Now they are building the platforms floating with three anchors that can produce offshore wind. So this, this is where I see Norway will be. We will be closely working on uh, energy. We will be, I think, pioneering hydrogen. We will be pioneering further hydro water expertise. We will also do well on solar. Imagine, you know, believe it or not, in Norway we have a lot of uh, potential. You have very long uh, Long days. Yes, but I in, understand in it's the quality yeah. of, the, of the radiation that, that makes it possible to really produce. So, and then we have the natural resources from, from living resources in the oceans uh, by fish farming, new, new, new ways of working there. So there will always, I think, be a combination between our natural resources and our skills and technological potential. I want to just close with one question about, um, about geopolitics. You are in a very... Um, delicate neighborhood. Your neighbor is Russia. How, how, do, you, how do you balance that, uh, that relationship, particularly as an energy producer? Well, as an energy producer, I think it's, uh, you know, it's, there have been orderly neighboring relationship. You know, Norway is Russia's only neighbor with whom they have never been at war. We have lived at peace with Russia for a thousand years. We have 200 kilometers common border. And uh, uh, I was foreign minister for s some years, and I negotiated with Russia a delimitation line in the Barents and Arctic Sea between Norway and Russia. That was the same foreign minister of Russia than the one who spoke in the Security Council yesterday. I see. And back then, we struck a deal, which was a modern treaty of how you divide uh, uh, you know, delimitations in the ocean. 
Um, and we have, you know, 100 kilometers from our border, the biggest nuclear arsenal of Russia's nuclear fleet. So I think as a NATO member, it's our job to be eyes and ears in the north. And as I, my mantra is to say, we, we want to see high north, low tension. We want to be predictable, long term, a neighbor that you know, you, you know how they behave and how they deal with things. The Arctic is going through tremendous change. You know, climate change is felt much more profoundly in the north. The, the, the degrees is not 1.5, it is, it is many more. So we need collaboration between Arctic states. We, we, we will need to deal with Russia also in the future. And I'm, I saw now statistics that per capita Norway is the biggest donor to Ukraine, to support Ukraine under this horrendous war. But I am also saying that you know, we cannot cut Russia out of the map and say that they simply not disappear. We have to envisage that after this, there has to be a security order that will give mm -hmm. uh, stability also in the north. Because mm -hmm. up in the north, there is an awakening to what Ar the Arctic really means in terms of opportunities, but also some major challenges. And climate change is making that all the more urgent. Absolutely. Because of the pressures on the Arctic. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you very much, Prime Minister. Thank you. Thank you for taking our questions.